Hello, everybody. Welcome to yet another lecture. I hope all is well with y'all, given the fires and all the other craziness that's going on. Please uh, feel free to contact me or call me or email me, however you want to get a hold of me. If you have any questions about this assignment two that we're doing or any of the lectures or any of the questions, por favor. All right, let us begin. So today I'm going to be discussing um, assignment two, part two, and offering you a lecture I'm titling the 1910 Civil Rights Movements and Backlash Against It. This will help you answer um, for the questions in assignment two, part two. Number one, how did World War I bring about new opportunities for women and African Americans? And remember to complement this lecture with what you read in the text, right? So use text material and this lecture material. Second question, what strikes you about the Jack Johnson versus James Jeffries 1910 fight and its violent aftermath? Um, number three is the big question. What strikes you about the rising racial tensions in the 19 teens and 20s? And how do you explain the rise of the KKK, the widespread lynching of African Americans and the violence that broke out against black Americans? And finally, what strikes you about historian W.E.B. Du Bois's message to returning soldiers? That's the name of this short poem. We will discuss it in a bit. <clears throat> but first of all, let me get to the issue of legality. This is an important issue because we're still struggling with and, you know, having political fights over it today. Who is a legal American? What does it mean to be a legal American? Well, the, eight, the 1787 Constitution, our second Constitution, um, only full, full citizenship was enjoyed by white property owning males, right? And every other group that were, wasn't included in the white property owning males has ever since then been fighting to gain more civil rights, whether they be Irish Americans, Chinese Americans, women, African Americans, Native Americans, Right. One historian, Eric Foner, has argued that one of the main themes of our history is the the history of what does it mean to be free? Right. Who is allotted freedom and liberty in the United States? For example, one of the first policies, one of the first laws passed through the brand new Cong Congress in 1790 was the Naturalization Act. And this offered a pathway to US citizenship to quote, free white persons, right? This was acts of the first Congress of the United States. Section one, being enacted by the state, by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America assembled, that any alien being a free white person who shall have resided within the limits and under the jurisdiction of the United States for the term of two years may be admitted to become a citizen. So once again, this um, made up definition of who is a white person um, gets this legalized fiction, right? It becomes a real thing encoded into our laws at the birth of our nation. If you fast forward, what, 68, some <clears throat> um, 80 years or so after the very bloody civil war, um, African Americans earned and won their right to become citizens of the United States. So after the Civil War, the 14th Amendment was passed and it said all persons born or naturalized in the U.S. are citizens of the U.S. and of the state wherein they reside, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So once again, the meaning of freedom is expanding as we go forward. It doesn't always happen that way, but this is a, an example of, right, who gets to be a citizen expanded after the Civil War. And if you took a look at the demography or where African Americans lived in 1890s, they largely lived in the South, right? And the result of, right, uh, 300 years or so of chattel slavery in the South, harvesting for free cotton and sugar and indigo and other um, agricultural products in the South. But this 1890 map also demonstrates that African-Americans had moved to other places in California, right here in the mining regions of New Mexico, and starting to move up into the Northern industrial cities as well. 
This process was called, uh, historians call it the Great Migration. Um, in the years we're looking at specifically, the early 1900s, about half a million African Americans or exodusters as they called themselves, uh, migrated out of the South to the North and to the West. Here's just another map, I love maps. Here's just another map demonstrating the great migrations to Chicago, Detroit. And this forever changed um, America, right? How we play and listen to music changed when you had Mississippi Delta African Americans coming up to Chicago and right mixing their musical knowledge with folks who are living there, white folks who are living there, right? Detroit, right, the Motor City. Um, developed its unique brand of music because of this mixing of um, white Michiganders and African Americans coming north. The second question, <clears throat> the second question I ask you here is about this a historic fight between Jack Johnson and James Jeffries. Jack Johnson's the guy on the left. James Jeffries is uh, the white man in the middle. He has his back to you. And even though we lived in a segregated society, many folks wanted to see this fight between this young and upcoming Jack Johnson and this um, older yet very successful James Jeffries in this heavyweight um, fight. So even though there was a Negro League and there was a white baseball league, right? We lived in a segregated society. Most, many folks wanted to see this fight and I uploaded a YouTube a clip about this fight and I, um, I look forward to your responses to the YouTube clip. Well, the result of the fight was that Jack Johnson won. Jack Johnson won the fight against what announcers called the Great White Hope and James Jeffries. And this sparked a lot of anti-black violence throughout the United States, not just in the South, in the North and the South. Right here, it says race riot near Slocum, Texas. Slocum, Texas results in terrible slaughter of blacks. So armed white mobs went out and um, attacked blacks because they felt they needed to put blacks back in their right subservient position after this uh, highly touted um, and filmed, right? You could watch film about it. This is early, the era of early film in which Johnson beat Jeffries. Um, it sparked lynchings throughout the United States. Lynchings was a normal way to put black people in their place, especially uppity black people who either owned land or were, who were rumored to be dating white women or saying things to them. So this is downtown Dallas, midweek downtown Dallas. A mob lynched this guy, Alan Brooks, right in the middle of downtown Dallas, Texas. And if you happen to be at the lynching, you could go to the corner store a few days later and buy a postcard and send it to your family members or friends. And here's one example of a postcard bought by a white person sending, right, being proud that they were there. Look at here's a little arrow pointing to uh, Jack, jo I'm sorry, the, um, the victim, Alan, let's say his name, Alan Brooks. And it says, well, John, this is a token of a great day we had in Dallas. A Negro was hung for an assault on a three-year-old girl. I saw this on my noon hour. I was very much in the bunch. Oftentimes, African-American men were accused of assaulting or raping a white women, therefore justifying not, not a due process of the law trial, but a lynching. And a lynching is um, just a word that means um, a killing of somebody without due process of the law. And I can give you various examples because there were postcards of these things made, right? I can't make this up. Here's a postcard you could buy. Somebody in a boat in a river um, looked upstream and took this photograph of Laura Nelson and her son being lynched in Oklahoma in 1911. It was just tragic. Um, a couple years after the fight, <clears throat> Jack Johnson and his white wife, um, Jack Johnson married a white wife. He was uh, over the top flamboyant in his dress, right? In the cars he drove, he was very much uh, a celebrity at the time. But this also inflamed many racist feelings about 
wow, these black men should be in their place and not be dating white women. So he was arrested on totally trumped up charges. And this basically ended his career. They stripped him of um, the, the ability to be a fighter. Ironically, about two years ago, President Donald Trump um, pardoned Jack Johnson. Interesting, huh? Please look into it. And if you want an extra credit, little report or article or podcast, let me know and I'll share it with you. So nevertheless, my overall point is that while things seem like they were opening in the United States, right, this black celebrity could publicly, right, um, marry this white woman. There was this fight in which this black American fought a white American, right, and he was deemed the winner. Um, so on one hand, while there were moves forward, there were also steps back. There was also a violent backlash against this. World War I also offered openings that Black Americans had not experienced um, up in, in American history. So since there were so many American men who signed up for the draft and who went and fought in Europe and did other jobs in the military, there were many, many factory and well-paid jobs openings and Black Americans were hired for the first time in these well-paid jobs. Um, about almost half a million Black Americans served in World War I. Um, many of them served under French commanders because white American commanders did not want to have Black troops under them. Right, but, uh, and many Black troops and many Americans really did want to believe President Wilson's words in 1917 um, during his arguments for entering World War I. You remember he said, our object is to vindicate the principles of peace and justice. We are glad to fight for the liberation of peoples, for the privilege of men everywhere to choose their way of life. The world must be safe, made safe for democracy. And the Harlem Hellfighters, this group of African-American uh, infantrymen, were happy to fight for America. They wanted to prove their Americanness. Right, even though they knew the history of slavery and the current situation of this apartheid uh, American system they lived in, they wanted to prove to everyone, including themselves, that they were just as American as anybody else. So check out the little paragraph in the text about the Harlem Health Fighters. Um, in addition, Native Americans who were not granted citizenship yet also signed up to fight. Right, so about 10,000 Native Americans fought in World War I, World War II. Um, and even today, the highest proportion of people who sign up for the military are Native Americans, even today, per capita, the largest proportion of folks. As a result of their service in the war and as a result of civil rights movements in the early 1900s, in 1924, Native Americans earned citizenship. So for the first time since Jamestown was settled and Pilgrim settled up in Massachusetts, right, and did not give Native Americans any rights. By 1924, 16, 17, 18, 19, 400 years arrived after the first arrival of Europeans into North America, Native Americans earned citizenship. <clears throat> However, Native Americans and Black Americans returned from the war, but they returned to a segregated America. Okay, here is the back entrance to the theater. The colored, um, the colored uh, balcony was up top and it cost 10 cents. And here's a picture of that. <clears throat> and as you know, the Jim Crow laws that were created um, by states was reinforced by the federal government. In 1892, this mixed man who was quote unquote by law one eighth black but even if you had a drop of black blood, you were legally considered black. He got into a whites only car, railroad car in New Orleans. He knew he would be arrested. He wanted to start um, a legal fight in order to get rid of these Jim, Jim Crow laws. So he and his allies, right? He and his lawyer allies fought this. And in 1896, his arrest for violating the streetcar laws went all the way to the Supreme Court. So now the federal government's getting involved and the Supreme Court in the decision called Plessy versus Ferguson um, reinforced that, hey, as long as we have separate bathrooms, separate 
um, cars, separate but equal drinking fountains, this is okay. So they codify, the Supreme Court codified this apartheid system of um, life the United uh, Americans lived in. This lasted on paper all the way till 1954. But if, as some of you might know, we live actually in more segregated times now than ever when it calls to where people live, where people go and worship. The old joke is um, the most segregated time in America is Sunday morning when people go to church. So from the 1870s to 1850s, the Jim Crow laws were the law of the land. Buses, beaches, theaters, pools were all segregated. And historian and poet W.E.B. Du Bois wrote this poem that, I ask, that I'm asking you about. He said, we returned from World War I, we returned from fighting, and we returned to the United States fighting, fighting for civil rights that the Constitution celebrates. A couple, um, a, not too long after the end of World War I, the economy took a tailspin, right? Not only in the United States, but in Western Europe as well. So economic downturn, unemployment skyrocketed from almost nothing in 1919 to 12% in 1921. Businesses axed benefits to workers, wages dropped. <clears throat> Remember during World War I, the government mandated that workers should not strike and employees, employers should pay their workers a, a, a better wage. So what happened to a lot of those African-American workers and those good factory jobs? Well, they were fired, right? Because there was an economic downturn or, and they were fired because um, white workers came back and um, took their jobs. So this brings up a term you might be reading about in the book, but uh, historians call nativism. And it has nothing to do with Native Americans. It's sort of redefining what the word native means. And nativism is simply defined as an intense opposition to an internal minority on the ground of its foreign or un-American connections. So that's a boring definition, but let me jump down and give you a couple examples. So for example, the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, and other um, white supremacist movements um, were nativists. They wanted America for Americans, never mind the fact uh, about Native Americans. They're totally ignoring them. Their definition of what an American was, was a white Protestant person, right? And they were against Catholics, Jews, Blacks, Indians, Mexicans, sometimes Italians, Chinese people, right? And they wanted to make America and keep America uh, a white supremacist nation. <clears throat> and doing so, Thought I had an office visitor. And the KKK was the most prominent and in your face organization uh, manifestation of this. Um, it was an every, it was a mainstream white organization. Eight million Americans paid the $10 membership fee in the 1920s to join. You could even write for free information, right, to 700 Sheldon, Connecticut, and get your KKK card. And it was and I can't emphasize it was such a mainstream organization. Oftentimes, if you were a white American, you couldn't get a job at the car sales lot or at the carpet factory unless you were a member of the Klan. Okay, so it was almost a rite of passage for many white Americans. Here are Klansmen, right, having a party at a Ferris wheel in Colorado, right? Just chilling with their hoods on, do, doing the Ferris wheel, having like a white racist bromance day. <clears throat> um, I'll post an interview with this historian, Lyndon Gordon, Linda Gordon. Linda Gordon recently wrote a book called The Second Coming of the KKK, and it talks about the re-rise of it in the 1920s. If you all remember, President Grant in the 1870s crushed it, but it rose again in the 1920s. So uh, I welcome you to uh, listen to this brief podcast for extra credit. <clears throat> in fact, the first feature film ever made, right? If you go to film school at UCLA or wherever, and you want to do film history and look at like, wow, what, what's some early films? Um, this one, uh, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, on one hand is seen as like, wow, the first 
full uh, feature length film. And, but what it did, the subject of the film is to totally rewrite Southern history. And the protagonist of this film, right, the heroes are the white Klansmen who save poor white women from being raped by uh, voracious black men. So in other words, it's celebrating the Ku Klux Klan's lynching and killing and um, attacks on black Americans for quote unquote black Americans attacking white women. It was premiered in the White House in front of President Wilson and President Wilson supposedly called it history written with lightning. He loved it and in the film, um, all the black people are white actors in blackface. Okay, there's no actual African Americans in the film. Um, I invite you to check it out. It's part of our nation's history, and I think it's important everybody just get a, um, a taste of a clip of it. But of course, not all Americans were down with this totally racist movie. Um, many protests of film premieres happened throughout the nation, of course, especially in African American communities like Oakland, California. Here's a protest in Oakland, California, protesting the the uh, opening of Birth of a Nation. <clears throat> so in this context of rising black expectations and demands for civil rights, in this context of a rising KKK movement, in the context of the economic turndown in 1990, 1919, um, 1919 was a very violent summer, um, especially we're going to look at the case study of Chicago, Illinois. Right, here's um, the South Shore Line celebrating the Dunes Beaches in Chicago, Illinois. Right, looks like a pleasant place. <clears throat> like most places in America where there were white and black people living, and most places in Southern California where there were brown and white people living that were segregated, right? Southern, the Southern part of the Southwestern part of the United States was segregating along brown and white definitions of who you are. So here's the rope that's dividing the white part of the beach from the black part of the beach at Lake Michigan in Chicago. Well, it just so happened one hot summer day, a young black kid crossed the line to go get a ball, right? They were playing ball in the water and the ball went on the other side of the line. Kid, kid crossed the line. Um, a couple white swimmers stoned him to death, killed him with rocks. Uh, the authorities there were torn about whether they should arrest the white man who did it, the murderer, but they ended up not arresting him, and it led to a big blow up in Chicago, right? The caption for this cartoon is, the color line has reached the north. <clears throat> um, African Americans went on strike in Chicago. White Americans armed up and marched into black neighborhoods. Um, people in black neighborhoods, especially World War I black veterans, did not want to put up with it anymore. So many of them fought back and hundreds were killed. Here's an example of a young boy who was stoned to death. And this sparked what historians call the Chicago race riot of 1919. Excuse me. Uh, this is a powerful photograph, I think, because here's, here's a World War II veteran standing up to a National Guardsman on the streets of Chicago in a black neighborhood. The result, <clears throat> these are the conservative um, numbers. Uh, about 23 black folks died, about 15 white folks died. Over 500 uh, injured, most of them were black. About a thousand left, left homeless after neighborhoods were burned. <clears throat> and Chicago wasn't the only place that experienced um, race riots. Um, the Tulsa race massacre in which white mobs right attacked a relatively wealthy black Tulsa neighborhood uh, happened in 1921. 300 killed, um, might, maybe much much more, only recently was a big gravesite discovered and they're uh, disinterring the victims of it as we speak. 10,000 left homeless in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Here is a postcard capturing uh, the rounding up of quote unquote Negroes on the way to the convention hall. And I don't specifically know what happened to these gentlemen who were being 
round it up. You can see the white guys rounding them up, but it probably wasn't good. Okay. <clears throat> and again, this was not unusual. You can look at a map and you will look at a map of the lynchings and the widespread violence, again, anti-black violence uh, throughout America at this time. It's in the assignment part two. Here's a lynching, and these were public events. People would pack a lunch. There'd be notices in newspapers about the Friday evening lynching. I kid you not, I can't make this up. Um, and people would come, they'd bring their families, picnic lunches, take pictures of it. And then you would see the African-American guy being hung, usually a man. This inspired the powerful and moving and tragic song by Billie Holiday, Strange Fruit. I'll post a link to this on the assignment so you can listen to her sing it. Um, in part it goes, Southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. And the strange fruit, of course, are human beings hanging from the trees. Many Americans were not taking this lying down whatsoever. There were protests. Um, there were vocal critics like Ida B. Wells, who's a journalist, one of these muck muckraking journalists who wanted to speak truth to power and get the word out there. So she crusade, her manner of crusading against lynching was writing article after article. She was based in Memphis, Tennessee and elsewhere. I invite you to listen to this 23 minute podcast uh, about her life. It's powerful. And again, you'll get major extra credit for that. There were protests in the street. People did march in the street, right? Look at them um, marching in the street in downtown Washington, DC. And what they demanded, they say, hey, the states are not protecting us, right? The state's rights are not protecting us. We want a federal anti-lynching law. And a federal anti-lynching law was passed in February of 2020, just earlier this year. It seems like 2020 is like the longest year, isn't it, everybody? Okay. Um, <clears throat> in response to increased calls for civil rights amongst African Americans, um, because of the, the events I just spoke to you about, there was also a movement to celebrate white power by celebrating the white South, the Confederate South. And the main, it's called the lost cause argument. And the main argument is that Yes, the South, the Confederacy lost the Civil War, but it was a just and honorable fight that they led. And any mention of slavery is totally erased from all these Confederate monuments and the rewriting of Civil War history. Um, in fact, you're going to be reading an article about how Robert E. Lee did not want himself to be commemorated after the Civil War. He said, hey, the Civil War is over. We lost. We must heal and move forward. Nevertheless, Robert E. Lee is one of the most statued guy um, in our history, still to this day. <clears throat> and please don't believe me, look at the evidence. Look at right after the Civil War, not many monuments to the Confederacy. Right during this early 1900s, and again a big spike during the Civil Rights Movements, um, the building of monuments confeder uh, celebrating the Confederacy or the naming of schools happened at the same time and were a backlash to African-American demands for civil rights. Okay, I'm going to end it there. And if you have any questions, please contact me and I will see you next time. Stop sharing.